That's hey, awesome. Hey, we're up. We were Somehow our technical geniuses behind the camera here. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, you're live. Yeah, don't talk about that. It's <laughs> okay, those... so yeah, we're back. Mini son of Monster Palooza with uh, Rick Gallantin. Welcome, hey, Rick. Thanks Thank for you. coming. This is my first TED Talk. First, uh, no, we can't say that. You're just talking with Ted. I'm talking with Ted. Start over. Ted <laughs> yeah, put it, take it down. We're going to put it back up. Go back to one. Anyhow, I've, uh, I've known Rick for 21 years, we just kind of figured out. Somewhere in about there, we met at Steve Johnson's Edge Effects. We think it's Edge Effects. We're not quite sure if it's X Effects or Edge Effects. We weren't quite sure. There was a little crossover. But uh, what what show were we working on? Do you remember? Uh, I came in on Spider-Man 2. Okay. Where we had a month of uh, R&D for Dr. Octopus. Doc Ock. Yeah, all those tentacles. Yeah. That was huge. That was a big deal. That show went on forever. Yeah. I mean, how long did we build in the shop for that? How long were you in there? I know. I think we had two weeks or maybe a month of R&D, and then we had... Of just R and D, yeah, which is unusual. Like on Jurassic Park, we had a big R and D phase, which right. was nice, um, or the beginning was used for that. Um, it was like a six month build. It I felt believe. like it. We had so many things to build yeah. for that, and it was so complicated, and Kaylee's we hadn't done watching. a lot of it. What's that? Kaylee's watching. She's Kaylee, like, hi Kaylee. That's my daughter. Hey boo. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I remember working on it too. I did some bodies that got uh, you know crushed and bent in half and whatever like that. But yeah, watching you guys. Because you did that mech that went up on the back, maybe? Or is yeah. Were you doing that? Yeah. He had the, um, Dr. Octopus had the, the tentacles, of course, and the rib cage that came around. But to interface into his nervous system, he had this weird little tentacle that ran up his back, and there were little needles that would go into his spine, which allowed his brain to control these mechanical right. tentacles. So, I'm sorry, I didn't explain what Rick does. No. Rick is a mechanical genius. <laughs> so, he's, he's one of the guys um, in the mechanical shop that will come up with, number one, you know, it's like all the servo motors and everything that drives all of this stuff that we build on top of, the foam latex skins and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, Rick is a mechanic who can make our monsters move, you know, the tentacle mechanisms, the, the facial mechanisms. So how did you get into that? What 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 got you into just being a mechanical to be into? Or um, a mechanic? I guess when I was a kid, my big uh, hobby was Lego, and that was a very mechanical structured toy and right. so it taught you a lot of math taught you some physics leverage things like that motor strength and gearing and whatever so um then i got out you know went to college i didn't know what i was going to do i wanted to do special effects because i liked the blood and gore from friday the 13th you know hacking them up and right. bleeding and so i uh was looking for a special effects field i went to usc which is a big film school of course there's nothing special effects anywhere near that campus back then and uh, so I thought, well, what, what can I do? I wanted to do a film where you um, do a, a shot of a guy coming into a room. He's the bad guy or whatever, and no editing at all. So it ought to be practical effects where he's got a functional hand. He reaches out, and a bad guy chops his arm off with a knife, bleeds, hits the ground, and it crawls away on its own. Okay. So that would have to be a completely self-contained prosthetic arm. Motors, batteries, logic, circuits, whatever, remote control. All has to be in there. And that's a challenge back then. Yeah. So, like, how would I do this? Well, that would be more like prosthetics. So I was went to biomedical engineering in college. And there was no prosthetics department. So it was like, ah. But I learned electrical engineering, chemistry, genetics, physics, aerospace. We did every engineering field there was. Rick's a smart guy. <laughs> Cheated my whole way through. It. Right. Okay. Don't listen, Kaylee. Rick's not a smart no, guy. No, I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, but we dabbled in all these engineering fields, which was great, which is a lot like the special effects industry, is we have people from different um, industries coming through. Aerospace people come through, they show us new machines to use, new techniques, and electronics right. guys come in, hey, here's a new chip. I mean, we have chemists coming through, changing skin formulations. There's all kinds of people melding in our industry, which gives us a great mixing, melting pot of all this stuff, which is what the effects, or the biomedical was to me. Right. I couldn't go be an aerospace engineer or a mechanical engineer or electrical engineer because I only took five or six classes in each thing. I knew it pretty well, enough to get into trouble, but I'd be a good manager of like groups of these people and be the go-between and really could speak right. through all, all their languages. Um, and then when I got out of college, I was looking for engineering jobs and they all wanted four years and masters and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, forget it. To make almost no money sitting in a cubicle just doing one thing all day long. What can an uneducated person do? Oh, build <laughs> monsters. <Yeah. laughs> so I ended up getting into special effects, and um, it's it's been great. I mean, it's you know there's good times and bad times. Right. The pressure's insane sometimes, and yeah. sometimes it's really fun when things are going great. So what got you in? What you so you're you're going to school for mechanical engineering and all this kind of stuff, and you're learning, you're teaching yourself as well, correct? Yeah. I mean. 
mechanical, you know, even going from Legos as a kid to, you know, now you're buying servos and airplanes and model tanks or whatever, you know, I've got to, and stripping all that down. But then, so you make this transition from schooling and teaching yourself. What got you into the film industry then? How did you actually work your way in? Um, I wanted to do special effects as a kid, but I was in San Diego and that was like being on Mars back okay. in the 70s, sure. early 80s. So trying to find anything in L.A. was impossible back then because we're dinosaurs. There were no computers. There was no Internet. <laughs> right. So how do you, you got to go to the library and look it up. How do you, you know, there's no way. So it was kind of a fantasy. When I got here and then graduated, my sister called me and uh, another friend from college, this girl called me, and they both dropped Kevin Yeager's name, who was a special effects guy I had never heard of because I didn't know many people and right. a couple of names maybe. And uh, they both gave me his name the same week. Hey, I know you're into this. Why don't you call this guy? Maybe I can get you an interview. I said, okay, cool. You hear the name twice working. in one week. Yeah, and I'd never heard yeah. his name. So I'm like, why not? So I called up and got an interview and <laughs> went there dressed kind of like you and, <laughs> in a, in a, with braces and the vest and the suit and a flambeau box with like my tools and stuff I had built in my garage. You know? right. <laughs> like I'm walking in and I'm sitting in the waiting room in there. And uh, Kevin Yeager's, and across from me is another kid waiting for an interview. And he's got ripped jeans and a ripped t-shirt. And he's like, he hasn't shaved in a week. He's got foam all over his shirt. You know, some, <laughs> some little shop guy. And I'm like, I'm a little overdressed. Oh, I just wanted to crawl. And then, and then Mackie Hussein was the head mechanic there yeah. on Child's Play and Bill and Ted. Uh, he comes out and he goes, and he sees me and he just muffles this, this grin, this laugh. He's like, oh God, who's this kid? Gives me a tour through the shop, and then I got hired there after a few weeks when they started crewing up. But people I was working with remember me walking around. They're like, that guy, a producer? He's in a suit. He looks kind of young. And they couldn't figure it out. I just felt like such an idiot. And um, so I, I got, dressed up, too. I told this story the other day. I, 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 dressed, I went to John Beekler's shop in, like, slacks and a button-up and, like, suede shoes. And he hired me on the spot. And I'm like, great. oh, crap. I got to work in this. So, yeah, so you get a job there. And, yeah, so I got a job there um, as a grunt, you know, just paying my dues. I was sweeping the floors. I was doing menial tasks like cables, like really long cables, running stuff in it inch by inch, 30 feet, 100 of those cables, you know, just right. for days and days, stuff they didn't want to do. Right. And I'm like, what's that machine? Oh, it's a lathe. What's a lathe do? And I came from engineering. Right. And I don't know what a lathe or a mill is because our stuff was very theoretical in engineering. It wasn't like right. on the shop building things. And I'm like, what's that machine? It's a mill. What's it do? And how do you... So the guy's like, oh, here, do this 100 times. So I'd go do that. And I would slowly learn how to use each machine one little bit at a time and, and get information from you and from that guy and that guy. So their techniques, whether they're good or bad, they all merged into me. And, right. And um, first thing I got to machine was part of Chucky's wrist on Child's Play 3. Okay. So they said, here's a piece. And they had little drawings of it. And it was a little chunk of aluminum. And I machined it off and drilled the holes. And that went into the movie. And... And that and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey was my first, the two films there. Okay. So, so then you become a mechanic. Yeah, so I kind of ended up in the mechanical and So you, how long did you stay around at Jaeger's? Just for those two movies. Okay. And then my first time seeing my name up on the big screen was Bill and Ted. I was up yeah. in San Francisco with some friends from high school and we're like, watch this, you know, silly movie. It might have been Child's Play, I'm not sure. And, and we're waiting for the credits and there my name went up and I was hooked. It's like, yeah. oh my God, that's so cool. And, yeah. And um, so within a year of that job I got into the biggest film ever at the biggest uh, shop ever so it was Stan Winston Carnes Studios oh. Carnes Surf yeah <laughs> <laughs> second only uh, <laughs> Jurassic Park and at Stan Winston Studios and so I, I I've got heard of it. really really lucky yeah I mean it's like so that's a lot your of second that. job no I worked for Rick Lazzarini space. for okay. a while in the uh, space between then okay. and then it was my daughter was telling the story um, yesterday or no actually this morning uh, I got the job at stands on a complete fluke as a lot of people get ins to companies just by accident by bumping into people i was at rick lazarini's and uh there was another guy named rick i think working there and me and rick was out of the shop and there's a phone call for him and then went across the intercoms rick line two rick line two and then no one picked up and it kept going so i'm like oh it must be for me i'm a grunt i didn't know anything and i picked the phone up and it was richard landon who was the head <laughs> mechanic at stan winston studios who is also a rick a richard you know right and I'm like, oh, hi, this is Rick. He's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Remember the time we did that? And I'm like, whoa, you got the wrong Rick here. I'm a different Rick. Uh, he's like, oh, I'm a Richard. I'm like, oh, so am I. Great. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and I knew whose name was. I knew his right. name from everything. And so I'm like, wow, I'm finishing up here. I want to, can I come interview? He's like, yeah, come on over tomorrow after work. And I went over there and then 
our job ended at Lazzarini's and they hired me on at Stan's, just kind of fell into it. I Did you ever it. tell Rick Lazzarini that Richard Landon was calling for him? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I wonder what that was for. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, Lazzarini lost some big oh my show. Oh, God. Lazzarini <laughs> said... We have this yeah, dinosaur we need to do. We can't handle. Can you take over? Oh my God, that's that funny. That was great. Well, read the yeah. That's, that's actually probably very true. Oh, I probably whoops. forgot. Whoops. <laughs> oh, so yeah, you wow. get to work on Jurassic Wait, Park. Wait, my phone's going. Hang on. Yeah, because it's Lazzarini. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you're over at Stan's then. Yeah. Working on Jurassic Park. Yeah, and that was and another you got long to do, build, which was great. And and you were stuck. You were in charge of a particular dinosaur, right? Yeah. And um, that's also another interesting story. So we'll make it quick. Um, we all read the book because we knew we had the movie coming in. Right. And then all the mechanics were taken into the lunchroom, and it was time to decide who was building what creature. And I was really new, really green. I barely knew how to use the mill or the lathe. You know, I was, didn't know what I was doing. But you didn't tell anybody that. Oh hell no. Yeah. No, I was just <laughs> <laughs> quiet. You know. And no, it was like, oh no, no. I'm pretty good on those machines. Oh, yeah. Which one's the mill? <laughs> Which one's the mill and which one's and, the lathe? And so they go, okay, well, who wants to work on the T-Rex? And I'm just like this. I'm going to be the assistant to Ted, who's the lifer there, who knows what he's doing. You know, I wasn't there. Well, the, the, the mechanic, <laughs> you know, like Richard Landon, I would be like his assistant or something when he needed parts made. And so like, who wants to do T-Rex? And all these guys raise their hands, and they're taking that. Who wants to do the Raptors? And all these guys. And who wants to do the Spitter? And no one raised their hand. And I knew it was kind of a background character. It wasn't like a main deal. It was just this. And I'm like, that's, that's a cool one to me. I was like. I'll work on it, you know, work right. on it, help on it. And they're like, okay, Rick's doing that one. And that was it. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait what do a you minute. mean Rick's doing that yeah, one? Yeah, it, it literally freaked me out. Right. Because I didn't, if they knew how little I knew, there's no way they would have done it. Yeah. You know, and uh, it worked out great. I learned from the guys watching what they do, and cable controls, mostly cable controlled stuff. So it was all one technology except for some of the facial features. Um, so I took some cues from them. I changed a few things that I thought might improve cables breaking and stuff, and and uh, it worked out great. And it ended up being like, I mean, it, you, it's not a ton of screen time. It's not like the no. Raptors or the Rex or something, but it's, it is like it wasn't one a of, lot of set time either. Oh <laughs> no, but I mean, it's one of those memorable characters that it's yeah, like the spitter. I mean, it's very yeah. It's that whole scene with Nedry and this and that. And we got a question. Datum3 says, is it still a favorite pastime to shoot paintballs at Ron Pipe's car? Did you shoot paintballs? <laughs> Ron Pipe's car? Ron Who's Pipe Danum? wasn't there. I, I, I mean, know. it doesn't necessarily happen we, to that show. We don't know. No, I <laughs> never shot paintballs in anybody's car that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> one might have lobbed know. over one person's car and onto someone else's. <laughs> yeah, if they can tell just... me what shop that was or where, I'd... Yeah, I didn't yeah, do it on let, purpose. Give us more information. Give us more back. Well, I have a I have a thing to show you a little bit later. That yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get into some touches stuff. on paintball slightly. So back yeah, on, so back at Bill and Ted's. I don't oh, think I had any paintball guns back then. I don't know. Well, Maybe we're just bon throwing balloons. I forget a paintball. lot of stuff. Well, like I said the first day, I said you know welcome to old guys talking about stuff they did thirty years ago. <laughs> you know, some stuff is true. Some stuff they don't remember. Some stuff we just make up when we can't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, Ron, if you fight. You never car. worked on Jurassic Park, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and it, it, coincidentally, though, your neighbor across the street right now is who? Oh, Wayne Knight. Was Wayne Knight, the street who me, so I the him spitter all the killed. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. He he told me um, that the the blue dye or the purple dye in the spit we hit him with right. like stained his skin. And the makeup artists were like mad. They had to like cover it up, and right. it, it it sank in a little more than they expected it to. And, and all we did, we tested it with a paintball gun, not at Ron's car, um, in the shop at uh, in Van Nuys at Stan's shop in the heat of the summer. And yeah. so we had a paintball gun that just had the air blast, no paintballs, and then a clear tube on the end. And then the clear tube was full of this goo we made: KY right. jelly, methicil, some food coloring. And so it was this kind of stringy, gross goo, right? Right. And so we're like, how will this paintball gun push that out? Will it look good? So um, I think Shannon Shea was standing there, and we had the gun, like the thing right next to his mouth. Shannon was pretending to be the spitter, and he'd go like this. We had a board, and we just fired the air blast, and it looked great. It right. hit the board from about this far away and, you know, with some, with some force. And we're like, oh, it's fine. But when we got to set, it was very humid because there was a lot of water on that stage. It was right. rainy, and there was water on the ground. And the CO2, when it expands, it cools down, and you end up with this, like, cloud, like, talking on a cold day. Right, right. This big cloud comes out, which gives away the gag, and so they couldn't use that shot of it actually coming out of the mouth of the spitter. Okay. 
um, which was really bad, be- unfortunate, because the tongue was really articulated. It would move around right. and lift up. You'd see the venom sac swell. Oh, really? And you'd see the pits, the poison pits, the glands under the tongue as the tongue lifted up. And it would shoot out of the mouth. Yeah. Um, in the film, the, the take where it hits him in the eyes, on the corner of the frame, my hand was right there. The camera's right here, and Spielberg's right here. And he's like, okay, as soon as you see him turn around and see his eyes, you blast him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I blasted him, and you see the smoke come out of the thing on the side of the frame as it goes towards Nedry's oh, face. Oh, so that's in the film, actually. That's in the film. You see, you see a little, little bit, bit of that CO2. Yeah, just a teeny bit. Gas. And we had to shoot him four times, which I felt bad. <laughs> because the first time I hit him like a purple mohawk, because I'm just aiming with my hand, I don't know. And it hits him like right in the middle of the head, and this purple, so they got to clean him up and fix it. Then the second one hits him in one eye, but they have to blind him completely for the right. show, for the For scene. the gag to work, yeah. And the third one, it misfired or something. The fourth one is the one in the film where it just kind of hit all the middle. But um, I think they dress a little bit more on it after they cut from that. To was make he a look. trooper or was it? He, he was a trooper because okay. he and, and Haley Joe Osment are the two actors that I have the most um, admiration for because he's got to turn around and know what's coming. Right. To be like, okay, shoot me, you know, eyes right. open. <laughs> and that does not feel good. It's coming out at like 100 feet per second or something or Right. More than that, probably. Paintballs are like 300 feet per second. Or did he Did he see you guys test it at all no. first? It's like, did you say, okay, this is what we're going to hit you with? No, he never. So no. I mean, He may have asked, like, hey, is this all cool? I'm like, oh, it's great. <laughs> You're going to love it. Yeah. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Haley Joe Osment, also, when he was a kid, we did AI for stuff. AI, also. yeah. And he was a robot kid. And so robots don't feel pain. They don't have water in their eyes or anything. So... There's a scene where he's standing there, very stoic as a robot kid, and he's just like staring off in the distance, no emotions, and there's these giant Ritter fans that are like six feet around. They're just blasting. It's like right. an pl- airplane propeller. Right. Blasting debris and air and wind at you, so it's just like he's in this hurricane. And I'm standing just kind of like five, six feet away from him doing some puppeteering, and I'm watching him, and he's just staring in the wind, and I'm over here, not in a direct line, yeah. and I almost can't see. My eyes are being pelted with little pebbles and stuff, and it's just it's killing me. And they go cut, and he goes like this, and they go watch his eyes out. Okay, go again. And he just—I don't know how he did it. How I don't old know was how he? Any, probably he was ten. Yeah, probably something around there. About there. Just unreal. Amazing. Good yeah. job, Haley Joel. Yeah. Golf clap. Now we're growing adult, but yes. <laughs> yeah, because. We're really old, <laughs> so he's clearly what thirty five or something. There's a my daughter's a photographer, and she had a shoot today, and the person she's shooting um, was like, "Yeah, I saw Jurassic. It freaked me out when I was a little kid. It freaked me out. Yeah. And I was thirteen when it came out. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I've done that to people in the past. Like, oh, I love your movies. I saw it when I was twenty, and they're right. like, or you know, like ten years old, and, and right. they felt bad. Now it's happening to me. Well, it was like <laughs> Nicholas who just left uh, uh, before Howard Berger. You know, I'm talking to him, and he's 21, and so he's a year younger than my daughter. <laughs> and I remember what show I was working on when she was born. You know, it's just like, oh, boy, yeah. We're the old-timers now, aren't we? <laughs> but yeah. it's fun. We yeah. get these stories and 30-plus years of, of, of great stuff. So to get into a little bit about the mechanical engineering, I mean, you, you just did some great stuff with me for me thank you on a show which we we i'm sorry we can't talk about and there's so much of this stuff in this film industry where it's like you sign your nda you can't say i never wh- signed it so i can talk all about it no because i signed it <laughs> i know you'll get in trouble not me no you'll get in trouble too, so we me. uh there. <laughs> guess who's not going <laughs> but no so we worked on this uh neil uh blomkamp project and Woo. you did a lot of like laser cutting stuff for me and we did a lot of 3d printing and Stuff like that, we can't say anything about it. But, I mean, so you got into that world of, like, you know, walking into your home shop is just like, oh, my God. You know, it's a it's a full-on. There's a mill and a lathe in there. Now you know what they are. Yeah, I do know what they are. I <laughs> and know you how to own use them, them too. And now I you can... own them. And it's CNC machine and yeah. laser cutters and, and 3D, 3D printers, printers and, and scanners and all that. Yeah. So. so, I mean, like, then you clearly fully got into the world <clears throat> of designing in in virtual space mm-hmm. and three-dimensional so how did that come about um back on men in black 2 maybe mark's tracking was a head mechanic at rick baker's okay and he came across this uh 3d cad modeling called cobalt which is the that's their version of the 3d modeling from ashler vellum and that's the uh program i use nowadays still 
it's it's kind of an entry level one. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people use like Autodesk Fusion 360. There's a lot of different flavors out there to use, but um, this one's pretty pretty easy. Anyway, the first time we'd seen this, and he showed 3D models of these mechanical things he built, and it was all rendered. Everything you could move it around in space, and it looked you know cartoony, right. but very crisp, very mechanical, like real. You could see it and go, right. oh my god, it's amazing. Because up until that point, we were doing some real simple 2D two-dimensional line drawings and a lot of it was designed like Jurassic Park was done on paper graph paper I mean the whole thing was designed and you do trigonometry where's that hole supposed to be and then go mill the you know drill the hole in the right place it was crazy so uh, we started getting into CAD so with the CAD packages as they developed further and further they became more capable and um, which flows into all the other digital art we're using now like ZBrush and Mm -hmm. Moy and all the other programs so Nowadays, we use a lot of um, the CAD designs, the mechanical components we do, and we'll have models of the servo motors and whatnot. Um, and we'll take like a, a glove or a hand or a, a person's head, and we'll have a laser scan of that. So we'll have a rendition or, or a 3D model of that accurate. And then we'll also take a zebra sculpt of like a creature like this. Mm-hmm. It's all digital, nothing exists in the real world, and right. we'll merge them all. We'll put the the head inside, and we'll put the motors inside, and then we'll generate pieces inside. So you and can 3D print all that, and right? Like keys together like a puzzle. When you're you done. can start designing your me- mechanics and placing your servos. You can start doing all that before the sculpture is done. Exactly. As long as the bulk of the sculpture is done, like none of the detail is done, but I know how big this brow is, more or less. Right. And I know how big the volume in the head is. We can start placing servos and things everywhere we need to put them. Because you know how big the eyes are going to be, so the eyes are yeah, going to turn. Yeah, we know like where they are. And, we have that like established, then we can start making the. Because obviously, back in points. the day, it would be like we're working on this creature. You're going to be our mechanic, but we really can't bring you in for a couple of more weeks because the sculpture's not done, and we have to mold right. that, we have right. to core that, and we want to get you a skin. Yeah. And so you had to wait for that whole process to happen, right? And it could have been weeks. And then, because in that scenario, we had a fiberglass shell like the skull holding the skin up. Right. We don't have a 3D model of this. We're grabbing servos in our hand and we're gluing them in, kind of. Oh, that's good. Then with another one here and another right. one. Then we're like, oh no, that's in the way of the ear. It's got to. Oh, they all have to move again. Rip them out. Right. Right. Put them over here. It's a pain in the ass. And in working around, if if a person instead of ever. Now you you can say you can say ass. Ass. <laughs> I mean, when <laughs> when you when you walked up, I said, oh, there's an ass. Ah. Very so good. anyhow, uh, so like I mean, like when you're designing something like that, so you get a 3D scan of the performer. Yeah. If they have to wear an animatronic head, let's say that's an animatronic head that a performer is going to wear. Right. So you get a scan of them, and then you get a scan of the character that's mm-hmm. over the top of that, and you can start designing all of this stuff in virtual space. Yeah. And start it's, start even building. It's sped up the timeline. All this digital technology has sped up the timeline. Right. We 3D print the brackets and the metal pieces or the pieces that are going to go in this thing, right. we can have those printing before the sculpt is even done. And those right. can be on my desk hours just, just after... Just waiting. Just waiting. Hours after I've drawn them, made them from nothing to a design, now they're sitting here and they will exist forever. And now you you're know. and now you're waiting on sculpture. Yeah. And, and it, it could it's be. Like, it, you know, to an extent where yeah. you can... I mean, I was so impressed with this project that we just got done working on where I was taking a picture of a drawing that I had done and Rick was asking me, well, how long is that? Just tell me how long do you think this is? And I get out of ruler and it's like, eh, it's about four and seven eighths, what, whatever. You know, he said, go get some calipers. Stop using a ruler. Go get yeah. some good calipers. <laughs> and uh, so I did it. And I, you know, I don't work in eighth inches. I work in <laughs> thousands of an thousands inch. of inches. Like that. So I, you know, I did, you know, I said, well, I, it, it's about this long because it's just a loose drawing. He builds it. And I'm like, my God, like that. All of a sudden in, in virtual space, you had built these things and we over oh, that unmentionable project uh, that unmentionable project and yes, you know we're printing them out and it's just like it's crazy just how quickly that can happen mm-hmm. now. and i mean at the same time we're model building and it's like we could barely barely keep up with what you were able to it's really fast i have three yeah. 3d printers now so i could print large structures on one and really fine detailed pieces on this one and really strong structural pieces on this one at the same time right and my laser cutter can be going and my um, CNC mill can be milling out some metal pieces, and I can be over here. So it's almost like I'm, I could be as fast as six people, right? And these machines are so much faster than the way we could do it. I can't right. machine that fast, or right. you know, model build a thing that quickly, right? So it's really 
this, this talk, you brought this this neat little mech here. Yeah. That and this is a design of yours that we're not going to give away all the secrets yeah, we can't to give it. Away the secrets. But uh, this is for a, a snake, right? Yeah. This was just an example of some of the design work. So when you have a a creature, or something that's got to move, you have to have a motor that makes it move. So those are little servo motors, or they're usually little black plastic squarish things that are found in remote control airplanes that make the flaps move or cars to steer them. Uh, they're kind of self-contained. You plug a signal in, you get them to move the way you want. So on the end of that, you put a pulley, uh, just like a standard pulley that can have like cables or strings wrapped around it. And as they move, it pulls one cable and lets another one out, which makes like maybe a hinge move, like on a wrist or a head or something like that. Right. And then you run those things remotely. So you put the motors over here, but the creature's over here. You can't, maybe you don't have room inside the creature. You have small little cable housings that go into the monster that allow the cables and the motion to go into the monster with the motors being way out here with the batteries and, and all that. Um, they're kind of like the brakes on your bicycle. So if you pull your right. bike brake, there's this metal springy looking thing that goes down to like your wheel. That's what's going on. You're pulling it here, but it's transmitting the motion down over there. Right. So this is like a high tech version of that, but a whole bunch of them. So this is a um, 3D printed, I don't know what center frame would be the best one. Oh, we, we, uh, I'm on this one right now. Okay. And right around around your face is okay. you're, you're good there. All right. <laughs> so, so these blue pieces here, these round ones, these are the pulleys, and cables go. These metal cables go and wrap around, and as they rotate, um, I don't know what section is what. Uh, the cables run through these little housings, all these guys into the snake, and there's there's six sections of tentacle mechanism. And they pass through and operate like this section here. I'm not even sure. Oh, here we go. There we go. So as this servo moves, this tentacle moves left and right. And then the one, I think this one, maybe it goes up and down. So if you want to do up and down, you could do all of it. <laughs> and then imagine this snake going, maybe this is the next section. Yeah. yeah. So there's the next section there. So if you do both of them together. Why did it have to be snakes? Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? <laughs> so you can. <laughs> So you have an up-down motion and a left-right motion. So there's two axes on each of these tentacles. And when you're on a remote control con uh, unit, you can do them much more fluidly than I'm doing with my hands here. Or you can program them with an Arduino or a propeller chip or um, any kind of electronics that controls motors. Um, so I printed the brackets that hold the motors. I printed the pulleys. And then I printed all these sections, and they all just kind of connect together. There's actually no screws holding this thing together. It's just the cable tension is holding them all in. Now that's another thing too that I, I want to bring up. So yeah, this is all 3D printed and you talked mm -hmm. about the, the, the way those connect. Which brings me to another thing that you just did not too long ago that we can definitely talk about. Um, that my you wife, like Ilona, there's yourself. a question over here. What's that? Um, oh, question? question. Yeah, any good study resources uh, you suggest for introductory animatronics? Well, there's the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. That's um, Ted and I are both have you done instructors. Yeah. Have you done on stuff on there? I did an electronics course on basic stamps, which is kind of like an Arduino, which is an electronics uh, chip that allows you to control motors and lights and sensors and stuff like that. Um, and I know Richard Landon has done... Um, tentacle mechanisms. Yeah, and he's done tentacle mechs and other... I think Rick Lazzarini has done... Yeah, there's a lot of people out so, there. So, I mean, yeah, check out the, the San Wilson School. That's probably the best collection of animatronics information, you know, and take from it what you will and use your imagination and and your own personal experience. I just, mean, honestly, when I first started doing, I, you know, I thought about wanting to become a mechanic and I just, uh, I kept drifting towards, sorry. and I know, <laughs> no, 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 because Ass. I, I so, I so, <laughs> I so dropped it, you know, because I did some stuff back home and I remember taking apart. I have a sewing machine. Two bicycles, yeah, and you can't use it. <laughs> you yeah. use it as a boat anchor. It is an anchor. <laughs> what? I said a sewing machine does not a fabricator make. Yes, right. you know, exactly. I own one. I walked by a sewing machine once. Yes. It's like, well, I know make, a guy. Make a costume. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I mean, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm always so impressed by mechanics. Just making something like that move, and the very little mechanics I got to do, like at KMB or even back at John Beekler's or Alchemy. It's like I had to do my own mechanics because it's like sometimes those are more fun. Where it's like popsicle sticks and glue. You're just like, yeah. Quick and dirty. Hey, yeah. this thing's underneath the shirt, and you just have to do this. I actually milled some aluminum that? a couple cool. a couple of times. I was on a mill. I was on a lathe. I actually I, I milled uh, a few things. Come on over. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let you use my sewing machine. Wow. No, but I mean, I I took apart bicycles and you know brake cables, and right. those were my first like animatronics that I did when I was a teenager. And I remember my parents getting so mad at me. It was a brand new bicycle. 
Your dad's like, going down the hill going, Boom. Not his bike. It was my bike. I almost said the other word. And uh, so, I mean, I did it, and it like made the lips snarl and it made the mouth open and all that kind of stuff. But I measured everything so I didn't alter anything that I was taking off my bike, and I was able to take it, it back, back off the creature and put it back on my bike. And my That's parents good. were like, two weeks later, I'm riding my bike, and I'm like, I thought you took that all apart. Well, yeah, I put it back together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's I like, just borrowed it. I wasn't going to ruin my bike, yeah. but yeah, I had to make sure that all of my cabling, so they were like, Longer yeah. and or shorter than they needed to be right. because I had to put this back on my bicycle. That's great. That That's really the heart of this industry is is problem solving. Yeah. Hey, what are my limitations? We have this much space or it's this thing. It's right. like, how do I work around it? You know, and right. that's what I, I love teaching kids and showing them like, okay, you have a problem. Think outside of the box. What's the solution? Right. There's always a solution. You can work on it. My kids, right. uh, I doubt my daughter's still watching. I'm sure she's not. <laughs> um I tell them my mantra is there's a solution to every problem. Right. And it's like, don't ever give up. What's the solution? What's the problem? Let's figure it out. And then once they got comfortable with that, I gave them the second half of that, which they rolled their eyes, did the whole dad thing. And I said, there's a problem with every solution. Right. Because like, hey, I can make this move. I have this thing coming here and doing that. Great. Well, now that's going to be seen by the camera. Shit. Sorry. What do we do? How do we hide that? And uh, you didn't beat me. Hey, yeah. you're not Steve Johnson. He oh, was here worse? yesterday. <laughs> he worse? Uh, Steve Johnson yes. have a question over here? Um, no. Or no. Is that the Vicky, fifth? Fern, uh, uh, Vicky Ferns. Oh, no. Oh, Vicky. Says, Vicky. hi, geezers. <laughs> <laughs> which, which build are you most proud of? And then uh, Nicole Gallinson says, daughter is still watching. Uh. <laughs> And then uh, Janie says, wife is still watching, too. <laughs> oh, wow. What does my mom say? That's all four people online right now. <laughs> Ted's mom says, I figured out Instagram. No, she did not. <laughs> I'm the queen That's of hilarious. the world. So, what, yeah, is there something mechanically the that you just kind of go, proud that's... proud of? Well, you worked on, at Rick's, uh, didn't you work on Mighty Joe Young? Yeah, Mighty Joe Young. Built the full-size <laughs> um, gorillas. I did, like, a lot of the head, the lip motions and stuff yeah. on, on the big gorilla. That was cool. Um, the spitter was, of course, iconic and iconic. a huge deal. That's that's I'm pretty proud of that because that's just know never going to go doing. away. Every yeah. generation is like Jurassic Park is always going to be there. Yeah. Some new kid is always going to discover raptors and spitters and and all that. So regardless, you know, long after we're gone, it's like there's going to be Jurassic Park. Yeah. You know. Um, as far as what I'm most proud of, I think probably one of the most complicated and stressful. Uh, Schedules Slappy. ever was slap no Slappy, Slappy the puppet Goosebumps. from Goosebumps no. too. <laughs> no, that, was, that was a horribly s- short build and yeah. no, that was yeah that's not the one. Um, it's a movie coming out with Tom Hanks that hasn't been released yet because of COVID, so it's been pushed and shelved. Can we talk April. about that at all? Or yeah, because they're talking about that it's out. Are they? That, okay. You know that and I'm not going to give anything away, but right. you know there's there's things in that that we built that. Um, Can we say the name of the film? Yeah, the film's BIOS. BIOS. Um, with Tom Hanks and so we built a lot of great stuff at Legacy Effects and um, can't wait to see it yeah I'm really dying to see it no I've, just, I've been looking for trailers and all this kind of stuff so know, we won't say nothing. anything more because we don't know what we can say but yeah. um, I saw the stuff that Rick built for that and the entire team it wasn't just you but there was a, yeah. a nice team of, of there's always engineers a, there's, there's always a team with the stuff we build it, you know so it's like not only <clears> the mechanical <throat> guys but the guy the stuff that goes on top of the mechanics and the things that go on top of the things that go on top of the mechanics yeah. and you know, it just snowballs from there, and it's just. Um, but it was it was amazing stuff that you guys built for that film. So yeah, I can't wait to see that. But uh, this is what I was going to touch on before because we were talking about these these connectors and all this kind of stuff. Is that Alona had worked on building the costumes for the Netflix show that's on right now called oh. Away. Oh right. The the Hillary Swank uh, uh, show, and you did some really fantastic pieces for that for the spacesuits. So you. talk about those pieces. Um. Yeah, one day I was walking through, I was almost out of work there, I was going to be laid off, and I walked right by John Rosengrant, and he said, oh yeah, I need you for a second, just going to make some quick rings for these things they're doing upstairs. I go, what? Okay, it's just machine some rings, it's take, a, like, a it'll, ring. take, it'll take minutes, you yeah. kind of, that's sort of like the, the attitude he had, I think. That's I the like, confidence oh. they have in you, Rick. Yeah, <laughs> so so I'm thinking, great, I'm here for a day or two more, maybe the next job will show up and I'll keep, you know, I'll stay right. on longer, it's great. So he shows me these things, and they're the NASA Apollo like eleven, whatever. Yeah. Um, the rings that connect the glove into yeah. the spacesuit, and also the, the, the yeah, the helmet on. deals. I didn't do the helmet. Oh, you that didn't was, do that one. Yeah. That was done by people in uh, Canada, I think. Okay. But the ones that connect the um, the gloves into the things, and also the boots to the leg, uh, and they are not simple. No, no. At first, I'm like, oh, little rings. That's simple. But then I'm like, oh man. So I had to 
do some research on. We got a few pictures of those things, and like, okay, they're made out of like fifty parts, right? And we had to make like thirty of them or something, like real quick on both sides, real quick, no yeah, big real deal. Quick. And it's like, oh boy, this is gonna take a while. So I designed, I reverse engineered what I could. I dumbed them down so they were functional, where they would slide in and then turn them and then they latch and then you have to push a certain button to unlatch it and then lock it and take them off and um and then i uh went and machined them all in my shop and right. then brought them into work and we anodized them so they're you, you see them in the show they're beautiful i mean yeah, you, they they've great. gotten a couple of good highlights on them and, but you also have them on your instagram don't you yes yes yeah. i just recently added that too. so what's your instagram uh rick uh underscore gallinson there you go. So check him out on there, and he's got a lot of fun mechanical things on there. And you've got a YouTube channel as well. Do you? Uh, yeah. Is that Te public or is yeah, that it's public? Technofile two thousand eight. So T K N O F I L E two thousand eight is my YouTube channel. It's all and kid friendly. It, Rick does amazing stuff. I want to show this really quick because I know we've got maybe ten minutes or or so left. But you do so many amazing mechanically engineered, and some of these things are for fun. Rick is super into drones, mm -hmm. submarines. Yep. And you like paintball guns. Oh, yeah, paintball guns. Back to that. So, uh, so yeah, to answer Vicky, one of my favorite things I ever designed and Ron built. Ron Pipes has just pulled up. Yes, yeah, get them. I'll, I'll get him. Trust me. Um, one of my favorite designs ever was, well, we were watching Predator when I was back, before I was married. And there's a scene where they're in the jungle and they, they try to get the Predator and they just shoot the jungle up. Right. One With of them's got a minigun. Gun, it's yeah. like, and they just destroy the forest. It falls Jesse apart. Jesse Ventura. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, no, he's dead. Oh, he wait, yeah, killed. that's right. The other guy picked Carl, it up. Carl Weathers? No. Yeah, I don't know who, yeah, he, his arm was blown black guy point. picked it up. His buddy. Yeah, yeah, I remember, remember that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so we're like, when my buddy and my roommate and I were playing paintball once in a while, I'm like, wouldn't it be fun to have one of those for paintball? Yeah, we, you know, I'm like, huh, I started sketching on paper, and I made, like, a crude prototype, and then it's evolved over the years, and then I built this thing, and I got a patent on it. So it, it's a paintball Gatling gun that shoots 3,600 rounds a minute. And it was That's, seen on a TV show. Yeah, it was used in the uh, TV show Community. Okay. Where they have a paintball um, competition on the campus of the college at the end of the one season finale. And across two different episodes, I got to be the one operating it in the van. So I'm shooting it at these people. Blank. So we added the paintballs in later in CG. Okay. But uh, it was really fun. So hey, You brought that along, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I brought it along. <laughs> Excuse me while I whip this out. Get rid of this. How he just throws his mechanic. I know. <laughs> It's yeah, strong. I can make go. another one. I just 3D print this stuff. Is like. this the actual one that was in the Uh, One of two. It may Street actually... Yeah. So this is the paintball gun. It's six barrels, electric. Mm -hmm. Rotates. Uh, you pull the trigger, and it'll rotate and fire. Let's see. Let's. It's going to get loud. It's going to get real loud, folks. Do you, wanna, you want me to hold the microphone over here or something? <laughs> you, or? It's going to blow Whoa. the microphone. <laughs> But I'm gonna I'm gonna set the hopefully we can still hear you. You let me know if there's any sound issues. I'm just taking the mic over. Yeah. For a moment, I know you can hear me right now, but I'm gonna right. step away. So. Small scuba tank for making it portable. Uh, yeah, you're blowing. Okay. We're blowing out the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Well, you just woke everybody up. Yeah, the neighbors in. Come on. Come here. There's a poster next door you could shoot it at. Drain the air out of it. It's okay. So the, the dog loved it. <laughs> so there you go. This is what Gordon Carpley. So I do my spare time. This is what she does in your spare time. So the, the, the fun thing is about this, too, it's got. Servo motors under here, so you can actually remote control, stay yeah. off camera, and this could be like a remote control mini gun type thing. And this is your hopper that you would put paintballs yeah. in. Yeah. So this hopper right here holds a thousand paintballs. It's a sprung loaded cap, so it forces feeds all the balls in, so you can aim up or down, and the gravity doesn't affect you like a normal paintball gun. Oh so this filled with paintballs goes in 18 seconds. Gordon Tarpley said the neighbors just crapped their pants, and then he <laughs> said cops are on the way. <laughs> right. right. 
Yeah. But uh, it shoots pepper balls, too, for any of my uh, sheriff department friends out there who want to, like, borrow. <laughs> hit, hit, wink, wink. I yeah. have I have a friend who lives amongst a bunch of college students, and she was telling me last night how she's so frustrated with the fact that they're like skateboarding at four a.m. And I said, you know, I have a friend who has something that might be useful. All something? they need to do is put some paintballs on the ground and pop them, and then oil will wreck those. Those guys will be on this. <laughs> They'll be not perfect. skateboarding after that. So, oh. yeah, this is just one of the projects that I've built on my own time. Just because it's fun, and can you do it? Can you take a paintball, which is made to break? Can you get it across this motion, this little gap? into the spinning thing without breaking the paintball. It's a physics issue, which I found an elegant solution to. Um, so that was the fun part. Now proprietary that top proprietary can't tell you. <laughs> But now that I've done it, I never use this. It was just to do it. Right. And like you mentioned earlier, my submarine that I built, um, it was fun to build it and figure out all the physics problems by putting electronics and submarine and ballast system and CO2 underwater. Right. And communicate with it while it's underwater and do all the things it does. Once it's been figured out and done, it's just not on a shelf. Right. You know. We got a there's a request for your YouTube uh, address again. Uh, T K N O F I L E 2008. So T K N O F I L E 2008. And then what we'll do is um, I'll get you to write all this stuff down, and we'll make sure, sure that we we post all this stuff in the the near future, so everybody watching can follow everybody who's been on the show. So. Yeah. Perfect. We good? Well, you can wrap up if you'd like. Our next guest is already here. I know. Our next guest is already here. It's going to be amazing. A fellow. So, um, I don't, is there something more? We've got like five minutes to talk. I mean, is there something? I have a question. Oh, no, yes. a question. <laughs> you know, working at Legacy, which is where I got into the special effects world, there were days where someone would come up and be like, "I, we have to have a crab cut a guy's beard, and I need something for this. Like, have you ever found yourself saying something where like, I can't believe I just said that that was my project for the day. <laughs> yes. Every project. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, um, and uh, our job is so bizarre. Like, I was on a mountainside in Argentina at night in the middle of the winter with the moon up there, beautiful starry night, sitting on the icy slope with Juan, mm -hmm. uh, a buddy of mine, Juan Mucky, and we're sitting on this thing trying to slide down this hill, and the camera crew is at the bottom of the hill filming in a forest, and we have a giant flare, this weird, like European, some kind of weird road flare, connected to my drone. And he's holding the drone in his hands, and we light the flare, and I go back over here, and he's like getting burned by the thing. <laughs> and then we, he lets go, I throttle up, and he lets go, and it takes off, and then we fly it that way yeah. to create these really cool uh, shadows and lights in the forest below that they're filming through. Yeah. And I'm sitting there between takes, looking at him like, just enjoying the view, like, this is our freaking job. <laughs> What are we doing? It's just, it's there's, it's so weird. You find yourself in the weirdest places doing yeah. the weirdest things. Yeah. Like you said, like, you know, a crab that needs to cut some guy's beard or something. Like, that could what? be tomorrow. <laughs> right. uh, where do you go? You go get to the crab mechanical store and buy one? No, you got to figure it out from scratch. Yeah, so. You got to build it. You got to make that. It's really fun. It's a great industry for makers. Anybody right. who has that bug, who just wants to build things, you know, it's just... It's well, amazing. I think what you said about being addicted to problem solving is yeah. like so critical. You have a seat we so we can see our faces. With, get with you know some of the other guests, but I think that's that's such an important part of being an artist who earns a living. You know what I mean? It's one thing to like sit in your ivory tower and paint something, but it's another thing to like find a practical application yeah. of your skill. And it is constantly like it is about being an artist, but it's using those skills creatively to problem solve and figure out how you're going to bring something to life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we got to do some of that, too. I mean, real quick, I know we've got <coughs> minutes left here. Um, Rick and I spent two and a half months in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, when? A couple of years ago? A couple of years ago. Two years, that on Goosebumps too. Woohoo! Woo and I, I told the story earlier. I was the guy that always got stuck in the blue screen suit, you know, <laughs> in a weird, weird position, like puppeteering, slapping. If you email on. me, I'll send you a picture of it. Yeah, it's on Instagram. Don't worry about it. I've already oh posted my it myself. I, 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 I nipped in the bud and just outed myself. So yeah. No, but I mean, I was in charge of that, so I had to choose. You got I to wasn't going to wear that. I'm not going to wear that. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, that was a lot of that show too, because it was just it was essentially you and I on set yep. from Legacy representing Legacy. Right. And then we had um, I'm sorry, who's the other puppeteer that was on that? BJ. B oh well, BJ Geyer. Yeah, and he was there puppeteering a lot of the times, and then who was puppeteering Slappy? Oh, um, um, I, I know. You just, you just gave me the brain freeze. I know. We just both oh. had the brain freeze fart thing. Um, He's the main puppeteer for Slappy. He, he did yeah. the first movie and and 
Uh, Avery, 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 Avery Jones. Avery Jones. There we go. Sorry, Avery, if you're watching or if it's you fault. see this later. You locked him in, I, I, Yeah. No, but uh, uh, but a lot of the times it's you and I. Yeah. On there in the truck, kind of going, we got to do this thing, and what do we have? And it's like we got some aluminum rod, we got some zip ties, we got some duct tape, and I'm so glad you you came out there. I got there like two weeks, three weeks before you. Right. I was just alone, and Avery wasn't as versed in what we had brought with us. So right. he, he couldn't really help me so much, and I was just like. I'm alone. This sucks, you know. And the, the pace was so fast. So we were two weeks into the film, and then they fired the kid who was the main kid right. and replaced him with another kid. Right. So then they had to go back and start over, and we had to reshoot all those scenes again. Right. And it was like, oh my god! And then you showed up. I knew you were coming with more equipment and more characters. I'm right. like, thank God, Ted's going to be here. He's got my back. Because <laughs> I brought, like, I brought my tools and I yeah. brought stuff. Because I'm not only am I a fabricator, not that I'm a mechanic, but at least. I've had mechanics tell me when they come up into the fabrication area, it's like, I got to drill this. Oh, no, no, I got some of those step down drill bits. And I've got some of this. And it's like, you're one of the yeah, best outfitted fabricators ever with your yeah, mechanical. Ted, Ted's being very modest. He's amazing. <laughs> and he's, he's so talented in all this stuff that he does. And I wouldn't hesitate for a second to give you something mechanical to do. No, I, I, thank you. Help, I, I appreciate seriously. that. Yeah, no, it's. It, um, I, I was relieved that you were coming out. I was no, like, and I, yeah. I'm not afraid to pick up a drill and, yeah. and do something like that. And, and he's funny too, because you don't want to spend a month or two with somebody you can't stand, which is like, <laughs> oh my god. So. <laughs> we spent a lot of time in a car driving around. We went oh. to the Walking Dead set. Yeah, you know, we went to the Walking Dead city. The Lego we, store. The Lego store. Awesome. So we had a lot of fish and chips. It was yeah, great. We did. It was fantastic. Well, Rick, thank you so much for coming. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming and blowing out the microphone and scaring the crap out of the neighbors. Yeah, they're very quiet. I told you to bring this. So So it's my fault, but it's so much great work. Find Rick. um, We're going to post, but his Instagram, his YouTube, just a brilliant mechanic and uh, a good good buddy. I've known for 21 years. So thanks, Rick Allenson. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ted. We're going to take a little break. We'll see you guys in a little bit. Bye.